Yo, what's up? What's up? It's the Buff Missionary. We out here again. Let's get it. Going through the book Steps to Christ. And if you've been liking these, like, subscribe, and share this with someone. And it's just been great realizing some of the things that I've needed to reapply in my own experience and just the encouragement that's needed, the reminders that it doesn't matter how much I try, I can't do it on my own. So I need to stop trying. <laughs> I, I'm not going to be able to figure it out on my own. So I can stop wasting the time. I can surrender. I can let go of my pride, let go of my selfishness and give it up to God. And he's the one who can help me through. But yeah, let's jump right in here. It is not enough to perceive the loving kindness of God, to see the benevolence, the fatherly tenderness of his character. There's going to be a theme here as we run through these next sentences. Check this out. It is not enough to discern the wisdom and justice of his law, to see that it is founded upon the eternal principle of love. Right off the bat here, you can be completely aware that God loves you. You can be completely aware of the, the kindness that God has and desires towards you. You can know beyond the shadow of a doubt that God has your best interests at heart and that he wants to give you everything that you need to make it through. You can be convinced that he has a, a tenderness towards you and he's not angry and mad at you all the time because of the mistakes that you make. You can be positively convinced of his character, that he is a good God and that he's not evil. It's not enough to know that he has all wisdom and that his justice is perfect and uncorruptible. It's not enough to know that he makes the right decision every single time. And it's not enough to know that everything God does, again, is founded on this immutable principle of love. It's not enough to know all of these things. All those things are great things to know. But if you only know it, it doesn't really get you that far, does it? I heard somebody say, knowledge is power. I would definitely argue with that because knowledge by itself unapplied is just knowledge. Maybe a better way of saying it is that applied knowledge is wisdom and wisdom is power. I don't know. You may have to play with that a little bit. But the point is knowledge in and of itself, you can know whatever you want. And that knowledge, if it just sits there and is never acted upon, doesn't do you much good. You can know everything there is to know about God. You can know from Genesis to Revelation, all the books of the Bible in order. You can know them in alphabetical order for, for all that matter. It doesn't do you any good. You can know all the stories. You can know all the ways that God came through for his people all throughout history. You can have all that stuff memorized and be able to, to spout it off at, at a moment's notice. But knowledge unapplied gets you nowhere. In fact, just think about regular life for a second, okay? And I will say this, even after saying that statement, I believe that the value I find in this book is that it connects my spiritual experience with my actual real life experience. All right. As I make this analogy and as we continue to go through this book, I want you to think about that aspect. These are not two separate dichotomous things. These are things that intertwine and go together and the principles in one apply to the other. It goes right back to the beginning when we talked about how we see evidence of God and his love for us, not just through revelation and divine things, but also earthly things that we can go out and experience on a day to day basis. Unless it's like 10 degrees and you're not trying to go outside, but we're not there yet. <laughs> we're not there yet. But check this out. How many of us have ever known that it was good for us to get a good night's sleep. And yet we go to sleep late. We don't get good quality sleep. We wake up whenever and, and we do whatever. How many of us know that it's probably in our best interest to eat reasonably healthy and maybe have a cheat meal every once in a while and not every meal a cheat meal? How many of us know that and then still eat like trash, <laughs> to be frank? <laughs> How many of us know that getting outside, breathing some fresh air, getting some good exercise, uh, stretching our bodies will, will keep us in better shape longer. And when we have an opportunity to do that, we'd rather sit down and, and watch some TV or something like that. How many of us know that it's a good thing to drink a certain amount of water because we are like 70% water to keep everything going well, and yet we don't drink enough water? There's a lot of things 
the list can go on and on. You get the point. There's a lot of things that we can know. And if we don't act on them, that knowledge is, is fruitless. It, it does nothing to benefit us. We have to stop trying to accumulate knowledge and start trying to apply the knowledge that we have. We don't need to get more and more knowledge and be able to continue to say the right answers to things but we can start to be in accordance with the things that we know. And that's how we can have a changed experience. It says here, Paul, the apostle saw all this when he exclaimed, I can send unto the law that it is good. This is the same guy that called himself the chief of sinners. Even he's making a distinction that for all the stuff that he knew, if you don't know a little bit about him, he was a Pharisee. So to be a Pharisee in those days, you had to be one of the best of the best young people when it came to your mental cognition skills, memorizing ability. He probably knew good chunks of the Hebrew Bible, which is our modern day Old Testament by memory. He, he went to the school. He was good enough. He was smart enough to do all of that to become a Pharisee. So he was at the top of the top. And yet for all the stuff that he knew, he said, yeah, I, I know that the law is good, but still called himself the chief of sinners. The law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Paul himself added this in the bitterness of his soul, anguish and despair. I am carnal, sold under sin for all that he knew. Paul realized that his great knowledge, his knowledge that exceeded the knowledge of many of those around him, his counterparts, his peers in those in those days, it couldn't free him from sin. It's so mind blowing to me to think that he knew these stories. He knew the history like the back of his hand. That's mind blowing to me when you think about it. It's, it's hard for us to memorize stuff these days. We won't go there. <laughs> and at the same time, he knew that that knowledge, it just, it couldn't get him anywhere. And he lived that. If you get the chance to check out the story of Paul, highly recommend. You'll get to see his transformation and how he realizes that this, this knowledge, this great knowledge that he had wasn't enough to get the job done. Pharisees lived a certain way, believed a certain thing about the law and how it applied to the gospel. And Paul realized that it was completely opposite. But we're getting off track. That's another story. That's another story. Let's turn this to the sin problem once again. How many things do we do that we have a knowledge and an awareness that maybe this is not the best thing that we should do. How many things do we notice about ourselves that we would like to change that we don't act on? There's a procrastination there because we can't do anything. When it comes to sin, we are powerless to make those changes. And sin, sin gets frustrating. I'm not gonna lie. We've all been there. We're there right now. We, we know how it is. Sin is frustrating because we can see ourselves in the moments of sin. And it's like, oh man, here I am again. Or man, I'm, I'm lying. I know it's not good to do that. I shouldn't do that. Stealing, whatever it is, it, it, it really could be anything. But it's like, we see ourselves there and we're powerless to change, even though we're aware that what we're doing is not a good thing. And it's frustrating because we end up continuing to do that, the same pattern, those same habits, the same ways that we treat people, the same ways that we, we speak, whatever it is that we're doing, and it's hard to get out of that habit. It's frustrating because we can't get out of it on our own. Paul was there. He, he longed for the purity, the righteousness, as it says, to which in he himself, he was powerless to obtain. And this is where it blows my mind because Paul... You got to read the story to really get all the context. We're skipping over a lot here. But for everything that he was able to accomplish in his experience, and you'll hear verses when you read a story about when he talks about all his qualifications and every every great thing that he'd ever accomplished and just just the number of like things that he could say to validate himself before any crowd of any people in any place at any time. And yet his words were, oh, wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from this body of death? That's powerful. If there's anything that I know, besides the fact that I'm a sinner, it is that I'm not as intelligent as Paul was. Many people consider him to be the preeminent theologian of 
the Christian church. He wrote just about half the books in the New Testament. And he goes in detail and talks about things in ways that it's still that there's still scholarly debates on. I'm nowhere near his intelligence level, but I'm just as much a sinner as he perceived himself to be. And the question I really have to ask is this. What's it going to take for us to have that same exclamation that Paul did, realizing that no matter how good we, we think we can become in life, no matter the accomplishments that we can put next to our name, no matter the degrees and the things we can accomplish, that none of that can save us from sin. What's it going to take for us to realize that as a human with a sinful nature, I am a wretched being in need of something outside of me to save me? Who will deliver me from this body of death. The wages of sin is death. There's only one way that this can go for me if I stay where I am right now. There's only one way that it can go for us if we choose to stay here in our selfishness, in our, in our, in our greed, in our sin, and not be willing to let it go so that Christ can come in and do something with it for us. This is the cry that has gone up from the burdened hearts in all lands and in all ages. This awareness, this knowledge has always existed. The only question left is how will people act on it? And to all, there is but one answer. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, the sin of the world includes my sin. It includes your sin. It includes everyone's sin ever and there's only one person who could take that from us now that you've watched this now that you've heard this that's become a piece of knowledge for you for me reading it here again it's become knowledge again for me but am I going to Pretend that this knowledge, just for knowledge's sake, get, grants me some kind of power? Or am I going to seek to apply it? Am I going to become wise to the fact that there's one way out, that there's a sacrifice, that there's a, a path that's been made for me through the Lamb of God to take away my sin? That would be wise. <laughs> and that's where the power is. If we can accept that and act on the knowledge of what the Lamb has done for us, now we can experience the power of the new life created in us from above that God longs to give us. Now, the fact that his whole existence is grounded in that love means something to me. Now it changes my experience. Now. The kindness of God is something that changes the way that I interact with others in the way that I perceive myself. Now, the benevolence and the, the goodness and the openness to giving that God has for me ceases to be just knowledge, but something that I can add to my character and look at other people in the same way and not be so selfish towards, towards them. Now, instead of knowing about God's wisdom and his justice and his fairness towards all people, when I accept the Lamb of God, this is something that becomes a part of my character and I begin to act in ways that others can see as wise, that others can see as just and fair to everyone who's around me. Things don't seem so one-sided and selfish and greedy anymore, but it's not because of me because of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I'm going to stop there for tonight and I'm going to get back to reading some of this tomorrow and I'm definitely going to think about this for sure and you know I hope you do too. I hope you do too. Once again it's the Buff Missionary. I'm enjoying spending the time reading here and sharing with y'all and if you have any other observations if you happen to have a copy of the book 
and you see something different that I'm not even mentioning, please put it down in the comments. Let's let's talk about it. Let's have a conversation. I would love for nothing more than to do just that. So once again, it's the Buff Missionary. Like, subscribe, and share. And we out. Till next time. Peace. We out here. We out. Follow the Buff Missionary. Sorry.